Okay, let's check out the nature of sound. The main point of this presentation is that being able to identify and define sound and its parameters will improve your ability to be music technologists and musicians. If you want to go into any kind of production or composition, it's just handy to know what sound is itself. Opinions about video quality are influenced more by the sound quality than the video quality. That might seem counterintuitive. You might think the visual metric matters more, but studies have indicated that it's sound that matters more to consumers. So bad audio ruins their experience more than bad video. Imagine test subjects watching videos, YouTube videos, say, and some of the videos have bad sound and some of them have bad video. The test subjects will reliably report that the ones with bad audio were worse. So it's important that you are knowledgeable about sound, especially if you want a career in music technology. Okay, that's why. Sound matters, especially for media production. And in today's remote environment, job interviews, the sound is key. So we're going to take a close look at precisely what this sound business is all about. If there were a textbook required for this class, it would be this one here, Audio and Media by Stanley Alton. It's a good overall music technology reference. If you want to know how to mix or are interested in game sound or how to mic a basketball game, then you can find it in this text. Alton also provides good definitions of sound and hearing. So I'll read these to you. Sound is produced by vibrations that set into motion longitudinal waves of compression and rarefaction propagated through molecular structures such as gases, liquids, and solids. Hearing, incidentally, is whenever these vibrations are received and processed by the ear and sent to the brain by the auditory nerve. So just a good distinction. Sound is the physical phenomenon, and then hearing is what happens in our brains by way of ears. To be sure, these are decent definitions, but they're surfeited with complex concepts like compression and rarefaction. Okay, so we know that sound is initiated by a vibration, like my voice, say, or a tuning fork. And then it sets about this chain reaction of compression and rarefaction. That just means that first the air molecules squeeze together and then the air molecules pull apart. So you might have been familiar with the word compression, but the word rarefaction might be new to you, and that just means that the opposite of compression is underway. So sound occurs when some vibrating object sets nearby molecules into motion and, and initiates a sound wave. So we can see the, the sound wave being realized on this violin string, it's sort of a shape of a wave. And then if we imagine a glass-like sheet of water that you perturb by tossing a pebble into, and then you can visualize these concentric rings moving out from the center. Well, sound is a lot like that, water waves, but instead of in two dimensions, just imagine an ever-increasing orb of waves emanating from an epicenter. Right? We have a ping-pong ball surrounded by a golf ball, surrounded by a baseball, surrounded by a softball, surrounded by a beach ball, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's just in three dimensions instead of two. But otherwise, it's very much like a water wave. So any substance can transfer sound, solids, liquids, or gases. But for the most part, it's going to be in gases because we don't do much mixing underwater. Okay, here's a schematic visualization of what's happening. So imagine a tuning fork. When the tuning fork pushes out, it squeezes the air molecules together in the process called compression. And then when the tuning fork sucks back, the air molecules, as a consequent, become rarefied or more spread out. And this is a chain reaction that just proceeds over space and time. Okay, there's the two words. Compression is the air molecules squeezed together. Rarefaction is when they pull apart. And here we go. Some enterprising artist has done it with, it looks like, dust particles. So the tuning fork pushes out. Air molecules squeeze together as a consequent. Tuning fork pulls back in. The air molecules rarify. Okay, so here's what's happening in reality at the top, the compression and rarefaction. And then we measure this phenomenon with a sound wave. So it does resemble a two-dimensional water wave, 
But it is critical to understand that the phenomenon of sound is doing this business up here with the air molecules. It's not shooting squiggly lines at you, but those squiggly lines are how we visualize. It's a bit like a prosthesis, how we can understand an invisible and inherently difficult to understand phenomenon with a model. So here's how the model works. When the air molecules squeeze together, the wave goes above the line. And then when the air molecules pull apart, the wave goes below the line. And then in the middle is perfect equilibrium, neither compressed or rarefacted. So this is what we're used to dealing with when we use DAWs or we see an oscilloscope, which is a way to visualize sound. If you're doing any mixing or producing in a DAW, we're used to these sound wave diagrams. Of course, they're a little bit more complex than just a simple up and down sine wave. Generally, the waveforms that we witness in our DAWs are complex waveforms. But conceptually, they're the same. They're modeling what's happening in reality, which is a longitudinal wave of compression and rarefaction initiated by a vibrating source like my voice or a tuning fork or a musical instrument or anything that makes a sound. And it's useful to be able to see a sound wave if we're going to do any editing or processing of digital audio. So here's my definition, a slightly truncated and more succinct version of Stanley Alton's, but here they are. Sound is the compression and rarefaction of air molecules set into motion by a vibrating source. And hearing is the experience of sound as interpreted by our ears and brains. A tree falls in the woods, it compresses and rarefacts air molecules, but unless there's a sentient being with ears and brains, then no hearing takes place. Next up, now it's time to get out our rulers and our stopwatches and measure sound itself so that we can make some sense out of it. In music technology class or computer music technology, we consider these five measurable attributes. Wavelength, frequency, amplitude, phase, and velocity. Now in science class, they might also talk about periodicity and other measurable attributes. In the realm of music, we're going to deal with these five. These are the ones that matter the most to our purposes at hand. And let's begin with wavelength. This is the primary measurable component of sound. So wavelength refers to the physical distance that exists between any two arbitrary points occurring at equal intervals along a sound wave's repetitive course. This is what that means. Sound is emanating from its vibrating source in an ever-increasing orb, and the squeeze-together, pull-apart phenomenon is actually happening over space, like feet and inches or meters. It starts its compression, and then it goes into rarefaction, and once it completes one of those little dances, it's covered some physical distance. Let's see if this makes any sense of it. Let's consider a sound at 500 hertz which is approximately this B here. That sound takes about two feet before it actually fully exists. From one compression peak to the next, this sound here, it's, it's two feet long. That's what, that's what a wavelength is. Just think of it like holding a yardstick in your hand, like I'm gonna measure this sound. How far did it run in the course of one of its dances? It completed one squeeze together, pull apart maneuver, and that's wavelength. Now, you don't have to measure it from peak to peak. You can measure it from any arbitrary point. I mean, you can measure from trough to trough or from zero crossing to the next zero crossing or anywhere along the wavelength as long as you go to its analog the next time it gets there. But the general way to do it is peak to peak. Okay, and that's wavelength, the physical distance that elapses as a sound completes one of its dances of squeeze together and pull apart. Okay, so the next one is dependent on wavelength, and that is frequency. So now it refers to how many times it did that little wavelength dance in one second. Get your stopwatch out and ask the sound to run the relay race, go! And then you stop the stopwatch one second later, and then you count how many times it did its dance, its wavelength dance. Like, okay, you squeeze together and pull it apart 50 times, say in one second, that would be a frequency of 50 hertz. Or say you squeeze together and pull it apart 83 times. 
mm. like the low E string on a guitar, then that would be 83 hertz. So you see how these two are related. First, we got to determine what one dance is, one wavelength, and then how many times did it do that dance in one second? That's frequency. Of course, musicians, what do we usually call frequency if you're a music class? Pitch. Yeah, or notes. <clears throat> Talking about pitch. Okay, here's another simple truth. The more dances it does in one second, the higher the note, right? That B is, is high. And then the fewer dances per second, the lower the note, right? All the way left on the keyboard, low note, all the way right on the keyboard, high notes. Okay, that's frequency or pitch or notes. Okay, next up, we got to measure how loud the sound is. And that concept is covered by amplitude, volume or loudness. Those are the normal ways we refer to it. But this measurement with our wave model refers to the height of the wave. Notice that this wave that I'm pointing with the laser is higher or taller than this one down here. Though if you notice, they have the same frequency, like their wavelength is the same. What's their difference? The only difference is this one is, is higher. Okay, so what does that correspond to in reality, this height? And that corresponds to how vigorously and how many air molecules have been perturbed. You can imagine you drop a pin. It's like, okay, yeah, it's, it has a wavelength and it perturbed some air molecules, but, you know, not a whole lot of them. But then you can imagine something like an asteroid impact, right, would really, that first compression wave before it rarefacted would be Bromdignagian. It would be almost impossible to imagine. In fact, if a sound is loud enough, then it just escapes Earth's atmosphere and goes into space, which is what would happen if there was some sort of asteroid impact. It would rocket a lot of the atmosphere off into space, at least in the local region. Anyways, that concept is amplitude. How physically vigorous the air molecules have been perturbed. And we usually refer to that as volume. And with our model, we refer to it as the height of the wave. Okay, so we got wavelength the physical distance covered by the sound, frequency, how many times it does its dance in one second, and amplitude, uh, loudness, determined by the height of the wave, and the number of air molecules perturbed. That business of loudness uh, is measured in decibels. So amplitude and decibels uh, go hand in hand. So you, you might have, uh, have seen this word decibel before or heard things like 130 dB, which incidentally is a threshold of pain uh, 30 decibels is the volume of an empty classroom. 50 dB is the, the loudness of a car at 50 miles per hour. 70 dB, the volume of a busy street. And 100 decibels, the loudness of an orchestra at Fortissimo. Incidentally, on Earth, with our atmospheric pressure, you can't have a sound louder than 192, I think. 192 decibels. Because after that, it escapes the elasticity of the atmosphere and just goes to space. The sound is so loud, it's just... The air molecules have achieved escape velocity. So sounds can be louder on planets with, with heavier atmospheres, like Venus or Jupiter, say. Okay, so that decibel is a common unit used to describe volume. And we'll come back to this business of decibels at a later lecture, because we don't use these types of decibels in a pro-audio context. We use a different system that is designed to aid sound and music production. So just set that on the shelf for a second. But do know that decibels are used to measure loudness or amplitudes. Okay. And velocity. This one's nice and easy to understand. Just refers to how fast sound goes. And uh, at sea level, uh, sound goes about uh, 741 miles per hour. Which sounds super fast, but it's not that fast. Much more finite than the speed of light, say. The speed of light, which is uh, 669,600,000 miles per hour, is quite a bit faster than the speed of sound. Now, you may have experienced this. Have you ever been positioned far enough away from a marching band that you can, you can see the drummers? You can see their stick strokes hitting the head of the drum, but then it's some delayed second later that you actually hear the drum? That is the reality of the somewhat slow speed of sound, especially compared to light. Sound has a speed limit. And the reason why that's important in a musical context is because of this last 
measurable attribute of sound that we'll cover, and that is phase. So phase refers to the interaction of two or more sound waves. So imagine one pebble tossed into that glass-like sheet of water and causing those concentric rings of waves. So now there's just one of concentric rings. Now toss another pebble in. And now you have this overlapping sort of chaos interaction of waves. That's phase. So the reason why phase is important is because if you have recorded sounds that you're trying to produce and they begin to elapse in a out-of-phase fashion, there could be distortion or volume decrease or any number of unpleasant sounds in your production. Let me try to clarify with the speed of sound maneuver. Pretend we were recording this guitar. I'm nice and close to the mic, but say I had another microphone set up and it was way back here. And I play the same passage. The first guitar would hit the microphone first, the microphone way in the back, the sound would hit that microphone later. And then if you played it back in simultaneity on your DAW, you might experience this phase cancellation business. Now, there are rules for microphone placement that help you obviate this problem. But do know that that phase or the interaction of two or more sound waves can distort your audio. So in summary, the measurable components of sound that we'll cover here, wavelength, the distance from peak to peak or trough to trough, frequency, the number of cycles per second, amplitude, the loudness or the height of the wave, Phase, the interaction of two or more sound waves, and velocity, the speed of the sound. Okay, th those are what you should be familiar with in the context of music technology and sound. Let's take a look at this next business. Let's do the sound frequency spectrum. All right, you can imagine this like a box of crayons and an analogy with the rainbow. So we can see. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, Roy G. Biv. That's the visual spectrum. There are light rays beyond red and light rays beyond blue, but we can't, our eyes aren't tuned in to see them. Some animals, I think insects, can see things that we can't in different parts of the spectrum. But the point is that sound is just like that. So the average person can hear down to 20 hertz this is 83 hertz and they can hear up to 20,000 hertz which is way higher than my guitar goes and that's like a thousand so imagine way higher than that pin drops that's our box of crayons we can hear from 20 to 20,000 whales can hear below 20 right so 20 hertz 20 cycles per second whales can hear i think down to five or so like super low things that would feel like an earthquake or just a deep rumble in your chest. Whales can actually hear. And then dogs, I, I think, can hear up to 35 or 40,000 hertz. I think cats can hear similarly high. If you've ever been with a dog or a cat and all of a sudden it's it looks agitated and looks in one direction and you might be sitting there thinking, what, what, what are you, what are you doing? What are you looking at? It's because they can hear things that you can't hear. Bats can hear even higher than dogs and cats. And this part of the sound frequency spectrum above 20,000 is called ultrasonic. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have something like a windmill farm creating earthquake type sounds. Those are infrasonic, below 20 hertz. And this is the sound frequency spectrum. And the reason why this is important is because to produce audio, it's useful to be on the level with your equalizers. An equalizer has divided the sound frequency spectrum into octaves. So musicians know what octaves are. That is an interval existing in a ratio of two to one. This A and this A. This one here is 440. So an octave below, if we were in a ratio of two to one, would be 220. All right, that's what an octave is. Anyways, it's a useful interval in which to divide up our sound frequency spectrum. 
So we think of, of the sound frequency spectrum in terms of octaves. If we start at 20, which is how low we can hear, the first octave would be 20 to 40. So that takes you to about here on the equalizer. And then the next octave is you know, 40 to 80. And those two octaves constitute the low bass or the bottom range. If you're mixing a tuba or a kick drum, you might get some of these super low rumbly thuds. And it creates the power and boom and thick and fullness in our audio recordings. Instruments that make these sounds are bass, guitar, tuba, bassoon, organ. Okay, so that's two octaves, 20 to 40 and then 40 to 80. 20 to 80 is the low bass. The next two octaves, which would be from 80 to 320 hertz, that's the upper bass. That's sort of here-ish in our equalizers, 80 to 320. And this gives sound it fullness and bulk. There's a lot of audio that occupies this upper bass. And it's responsible for most of the lower tones generated by rhythm sections, right? If you're playing chords, like on a piano, right, I got, I got a a lot of these sort of upper bass frequencies. So this would be the lower tones generated by rhythm sections. Typical instruments would be, you know, drums, guitar, piano, banjo, vibraphone. They're not isolated only to the upper bass, but a lot of their fundamental pitches, their lowest, most powerful sounds reside in the upper bass. And then next up, we got uh, 320 to 2560, or three octaves. So from around here-ish, 320 all the way up to 2560 to here. And this is the mid-range. And the mid-range is the most vied for and occupied portion of the sound frequency spectrum. When it comes to mixing audio, th this is where the rubber hits the road. It's difficult to manage the mid-range because there's so much trying to occupy the mids, pianos, guitars, singing, brass instruments, wind instruments, mid-range, mid-range, mid-range. Many musical sounds reside here. And as a contributing factor to the difficulty of this range is humans are extra sensitive to this range, that we hear sounds in this range as if they were louder than sounds in other parts of the sound frequency spectrum. That really matters for mixing. Think about the fundamental notes of instruments like violin, mandolin, ukulele, flute, oboe, trumpet. They fundamentally exist in the mid-range. And if mishandled my producers, the mid-range can be unpleasant and blaring and honking. So it's generally wise when using your equalizer to apply some cuts, right? Just do some volume reductions around 500, say. Like, oh, it's just such a mess, this recording. There's a thousand instruments trying to sound right on top of one another then you can try to decrease some of these sounds in the mid-range. Okay, so from 2560 to 5120, that's the upper mid-range, just one octave. And this is the domain of consonants in speech. So as I'm speaking here and I'm saying words, you can understand what I'm saying because of the consonants, the parts of the words. Those sounds are in the upper mid-range critical to the intelligibility of speech. These sounds too should be handled with caution because too much energy here can sound harsh or acerbic or unpleasant. The timbre or the characteristic of the sound can be rendered unlistenable if mishandled with your equalizer. So probably shouldn't go doing huge boosts here in the upper mid range. And then finally, the last two octaves from about 5,000 up to 20,000. And that's the domain of treble responsible for much of the luster and liveliness in your sound. The treble range can also misbehave if it's not attended to with caution. Too much treble can result in strident and shrill and unpleasantly bright sounds. Okay, in summary, this is the sound frequency spectrum. This is where humans are sensitive. It's pretty vast, so it's divided up into regions via octaves, and the regions are low bass. The first two octaves upper bass, the next two, mid-range, the next three, upper mid-range, the next one, and then treble, the last two. You may have seen these designations on your equalizers. Next, we'll talk about the equal loudness principle. This is an important one for music technologists and mixing. The equal loudness principle stipulates that human beings are more sensitive to sounds in the mid-range. 
than they are to sounds in any other part of the sound frequency spectrum. That means that the sounds from 320 to 2560, that is where we are most sensitive. And what that means in practice is that we actually hear sounds in that range as if they were louder, which is strange. Imagine two sounds, one's in the mid-range, one's in the treble. They had the exact same amplitude. Their volumes were precisely the same. Humans would say, yeah, that mid-range sound is louder. Okay, it's pretty curious. This diagram here illustrates the truth quite well. So what we have along the x-axis is frequency. So, you know, here's 20 all the way downstairs. Here's 500. Here's 1,000. My guitar doesn't go quite to 1,000, but that's close enough. 1,000 and then all the way up to 20,000. On this axis, the y-axis, we have our decibels or volume, the amplitude. Now, these weird looking curves, they are the threshold of audibility. If you've ever taken a hearing test, the machine plays a sound for you. And as soon as you hear it, you raise your hand. That's what this is. This is the moment that people raise their hands, though this is a conglomeration of many people. So statistically, when you raise your hand in your hearing test, that's where this line is drawn. So let me show you what I mean. Here's a thousand hertz. The tester plays that sound, and then you raise your hand when that sound is, what, at five decibels? Really quiet. Now imagine a sound here at 50, right, all the way down, like even lower than this sound. You don't raise your hand on 50 until that sound is at 50 dB. That's a crazy difference. Just allow this to detonate in your mind the next time you go to mix something. Humans are more sensitive to sounds in the mid-range. And then something similar happens with treble. And then we become decreasingly sensitive to treble, right? So at 10,000, you don't raise your hand until it's 20 dB, right? Compare that to 1,000. Incidentally, this 1,000 is where we are the most sensitive. And that's where they bleep out profanity on TV when they edit it. They just like, Boo! They put a giant 1,000 over top of what's happening because they know that it's going to be louder than any sound that we're going to be sensitive to. That's the, that's the reason why they use that sound. We just are more sensitive there. A guitar illustrates this principle nicely. So I'm going to take a guitar pick and just strum evenly through all six strings. Now, since the low E string is around 82, and the high E string is around 330, there's gonna be a difference in perception here. But the high E string is almost in the mid range, right? It's in the upper bass approaching the mid range. And the, the low E string, that's in the bass range. And then when I strum all six, what do you hear? What do you hear? What do you hear? You hear this, right? This high E string is a bully, man. Like, hey, I'm louder than everyone, even though I'm trying my best to play them all equally forceful. So I played the strings with the same force, but that high E string poked right out at you. There's the equal loudness principle in your face. Like, yeah, this is true. Okay, here's another phenomenon that is critical to mixing music and dealing with audio, and that is masking. And masking is the phenomenon of one sound partially obscuring or completely covering another sound, usually if they're of similar frequency. We have a sound here at 250, it's 70 dB, and then we have another sound here, it's like 150-ish, and it's only at 40. That means that if these sounds are happening simultaneously, the louder of the two will likely cover up and render inaudible the quieter sound. Now this occurs in many avenues of life. You're driving around in your automobile and you have your car stereo set just so, and then you become hot and you put the window down. Now you gotta turn your stereo up because the hurricane simulator wind sound coming in through the window is masking the sound of your radio. Now take this into the pro audio realm and you have something like your kick drum and your bass guitar. You spend a lot of time mixing your drum set, your kick drum pff, 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 sounds just right. You like your beat. And now comes time to mix in, right? The bass. 
Now all of a sudden you can't even hear the kick drum anymore. It's because the bass has begun masking the sound of the kick drum. Right? Think of the bass guitar and the kick drum are occupying roughly the same portion of the sound frequency spectrum. So masking is an issue for mixing. Okay, crossing the finish line here, let's talk about the concept of timbre, which is a sound's distinguishing feature. It's how you can tell one sound from another. It's how you can tell that it's your mom on the phone and not your girlfriend or vice versa. Your mom and your girlfriend have different sounding voices. What's different about them? Their timbre. So too with instruments. Imagine you have a bass line being played by a bass guitar, say, which would sound a lot like this guitar. Now imagine that same bass line being played by a tuba, which incidentally can play precisely the same notes as a bass guitar. But even if the tuba was playing the same bass line with your eyes closed, you would say, yeah, that's the tuba and that's the bass guitar. Well, what's up here? How can you tell them apart? They're playing the same frequencies. They're playing the same rhythm. What's different about them is their timbre, the distinguishing feature, the characteristic of sound. Okay, so what accounts for this? What is timbre? Well, as it happens, there are, are two phenomena that are critical to creating timbre. One is the harmonic series, and the other is the sound envelope. So let's take a look at the harmonic series first. Brass instrumentalists will be familiar with this. The harmonic series illustrates a simple truth about uh, musical sounds and most natural occurring sounds. And that is within one vibration, there are generally sympathetically generated smaller vibrations. And they typically exist at mathematic ratios like an octave and a fifth. And indeed, this is how the harmonic series unfolds on the grand staff. So we're going to start down at this C. I don't got the C below the bass clef, but imagine a C lower than this one, right? And then you go to the octave, right? And then an octave and a fifth, right? And then a fourth higher than that, right? And then a third, right? And a third. Then to this D, right? Then the intervals get tighter as you get towards the top. And then I'm going to run out of notes. The point is, those intervals are mathematically pure with one another. Octaves, and then fifths, and fourths, and thirds. Now, here's where it gets fancy. Those other notes of the harmonic series here exist within the fundamental, right? That first note down here. Imagine a tuning fork vibrating back and forth. It's got big wiggles and little wiggles happening in a sort of sequence. It's perturbing the atmosphere in a way that creates overlapping multiple frequencies that conspire to create one sound that has its own discrete timbre. So you can imagine that a bass guitar and a tuba are stimulating the overtone series differently. This is part of what contributes to timbre. Another contributing factor to timbre is the sound envelope. And a sound envelope is a sound's life story. This is how it unfurls. An instrument initiates and sustains a pitch. The initiation is known as the attack, right? You can imagine a drumstick hitting a drum head, or you can imagine the hammer of a piano hitting a, a note or a finger plucking a guitar string, that's the attack. And then immediately after the attack, there's a little fall off, a decay. And then usually for a long time, there'll be some sustain. The note's just lasting. And then at the end, the note dies with a release. If you're playing a violin, that's how long your bow can hold out for. Or if you're playing a wind instrument, you sustain and then release whenever you run out of breath. Okay, that's the schematic form. Now, usually we're dealing with a complex waveform with these multiple overtones conspiring to create a specific timbre. But the shape of the wave is generally apparent and full of information. For example, we can tell without pressing play that this sound over here has quite a bit more sustain and time before release than this sound here. 
this sound here looks like all transients, right? Crack, 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 almost like a drum. And this one looks like it's a attack and then it sustains for a while and then an attack it sustains for a while but decreases attack sustains for a while but decreases like a piano or a guitar and you can imagine a brass instrument these would be squared off more because you can maintain the wind and keep the volume of your sustain at one level string instruments you know, after you play the note it's just going to decay until it dies so you can tell what instrument you're editing oftentimes before you even press play Okay, here are the key takeaways. Sound is the compression and rarefaction of molecules set into motion by a vibrating source. Okay, good definition. Sound can be measured for wavelength, frequency, amplitude, velocity, and phase. There are others, but in music class, those are the important ones. The sound frequency spectrum, or the sound box of crayons is divided into five regions, low bass, upper bass, mid-range, upper mid-range, and treble. And we use the octave to divide those up. Low bass is the first two octaves. Upper bass is the two after that. Mid-range is three octaves after that. Upper mid-range is one octave, and then treble is the last two. The equal loudness principle defines our unequal perception of bass, mid-range, and treble. You would think that a better name would be the the unequal loudness principle. In any case, we just hear mid-range better. That's just what's true. A sound's timbre is its distinguishing character. I know it's this sound and not that sound because of its unique characteristic. Uh, differences in timbre are described by differences in the sound envelope, the sound's life story, and the harmonic series, the overlapping pitch content resonant within one sound. Within one sound, there are many sympathetically generated higher frequencies. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks for watching.